my education is, is, was a very theoretical one, so to make an object was completely forbidden, actually. Uh, and I never imagined making objects. And, and this kind of um, allergy to looking at an object in a very like, um, classical way, which is very hierarchical, like, and about things that I'm not interested in, like beauty or material mm -hmm. in this very classical sense. And, and, and this kind of oppressive gaze that ha one has when you're so focused on one object. I think in a, in a filmic, um, uh, in, let's say, in a filmic sense, you have the opportunity to focus on certain things at certain moments, and, but, but you can choreograph that, and architecture has that, and I was more interested, and film, of course, has this framing, and this, you know, this way of either through narrative or through the image itself, one can settle on things or move quickly or and this was something really missing from the kind of vocabulary of sculpture in yeah. a classical sense but but I didn't really want to give up on this potential that um, sculpture has as being moments within a larger context of you know society or, or architecture or urban environments yeah no, function is a heavy burden yeah. huh, for architecture and of, and of course it is a big program for architecture it's true uh, it's interesting. I mean, I really love, I, I think the reason I even began uh, pursuing art or sculpture or 3D vocabulary, three-dimensional vocabulary is, is because of um, still this desire to, with a dialogue with architecture, like, and trying, and in the beginning it was so much about understanding that sculpture had a very parasitic relationship mm -hmm. to the structures, you know, museums or galleries or even domestic homes, like that, 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 that kind of conversation wasn't really happening. But, but like in Chicago, for instance, I remember as a kid being super excited by, you know, the skyscrapers and large sculptures, and somehow there was a love affair, but that's early modernism. Yeah. Like this, and then that's fallen completely, which I understand why, and I mean, it's too monumental, it's a mess in a lot of ways, but this kind of initial impulse which seduced me, of like, there, there is something really wonderful about that conversation. So I still believe in it, even though I've been on a, a lot of, you know, panel discussions where, where art and architecture, and we never get anywhere. It's just very, very distinctly different in our approaches, yeah. obviously, but I still believe that there's lots to learn from each other. And I think it was an impulse like 25 years ago when I started, but lately I've been really able to kind of use architectural as a material. And car like a, a show in, at MACBA in Barcelona a couple of years ago, I really, you know, used it as archaeology, taking down like fake walls and mm -hmm. creating spaces um, within, as a, you know, architecture as a material. And knowing Richard Meyer, I'm, I mean, kind of really being aware of what that is, not just intuitively, uh, take this one down, put this one up, but um, really playing with it. And, and here has been really fantastic. And uh, working with Protectura mm -hmm. to realize a project that I've been working with since the early 90s, um, which is based on a full-scale model of the uh, Villa Savoie by Le Corbusier. Mm -hmm. Um, but to orient, I mean, we st when we started working together with Productora, um, it was fascinating because I said, no, 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 let's, let's just make the most interesting way of fitting this in here, not about can this piece fit here or... And, and then we really had a lot of fun trying to organize these spaces uh, and find a lot of different views, which this is the most exciting part, um, to see it here in Tamayo because there are so many views that have been created and, and you can see many things at once. So actually, it's the best realization of, of this vocabulary that I have, um, that I've you know, been lucky enough to try over the years. But this is so far really exciting. There's a kind of compression also that, yeah. that, that didn't, hasn't existed in the other um, installations. It's, it's funny because I, I know that Corbusier is so uh, present right now, but when I first started you know, I mean, I was like at the, a bookstore called The Strand in New York mm -hmm. City, and I always go through the, it's a second-hand bookstore, a huge mm -hmm. one, and um, I always go through, like, the architecture section, and, you know, looking, and there was this huge section of Luc Bousier, and obviously he, you know, published many, many books, and his own writings, etc., and there are many books about him, but at the moment, so this is in the, like, early 80s, nobody wanted to read it, so there was this huge section, and it really caught my attention, because mm -hmm. everybody would rather read, you know, like, learning from Las Vegas than yeah. The Donkey's Way, so basically, and so this really started me, I mean, of course we know 
the Villa Savoie from looking in any book. It's mm -hmm. a, you know, it's an icon, a domestic modernist icon, and you know, so somehow you know it anyway. But like getting into Corbusier, I really was from this experience of just seeing this large section of un, you know mm -hmm. people didn't want those books anymore, so they were selling them secondhand. And then I was like, wow, there must be something here. And then really getting very interested in in the the kind of promises that modernism you know gave and being born in 1960 I really feel like a baby of all these promises like man on the moon and you know what we were mm -hmm. going to expect was super exciting and, and kind of understanding the perversity of that all of a sudden and realizing you know at age 23 that wow this isn't really going to happen is it like this is you know like becoming a little more humorous and dubious about what the promises were, but still very fascinated by Corbusier's um, vision, in fact, and, and with all the problems that that comes with, obviously, but um, really uh, also finding huge amounts of humor, and that sort of was the beginning. And it's not like, it, and, and actually for years of uh, installing this full-scale model of the, um, pla of the uh, plan of the Villa Savoie, I never went there. I could never kind of afford it, and or, you know, it wasn't on my entrail or whatever. And, and um, so it was all, only through images that I was recreating this, this, this scale and this domestic scale of modernism, by which I could put my vocabulary or try to understand uh, vocabulary of, of objects in the choreography of space. Think about it more, but the immediate answers are more about this kind of transitory nat nature that we as artists have. Like that, often it's not monumental; that these are not staying there forever. That you know, there's a, not a permanence to the position that they take. So this temporary, temporality, or you know, this um, temporary nature that we have, and this is really what this piece is about. Mm -hmm. Like having a modular system which can go up and down and you know sometimes it fits like this which is incredible and other times it, it has other dimensions which are a little more awkward or more interesting or whatever but um, that, that we have that opportunity actually that this movement is um, key to you know experiencing things differently and, and that ability to be um, I guess light-footed, you know, like to not have um, to, ha to have flexibility built into any any architecture or any ideas of architecture. I think is totally key for for museums for for everything. Actually, I mean that um, being able to pro to produce um, situations for people to inhabit or to to demonstrate or to occupy in a in a you know as a public together or singular. Has, ha, has to have that flexibility and I think like uh, these kind of tribunal structures are kind of fascinating models for that because you know when they're full there's something in you know thousands of people watching soccer I mean I think 500 people fit here but like, you know the, the, and then when they're empty they sit in the landscape empty as these strange uh, very representative of like a gathering but when they're empty they're completely the function is completely gone and they become some kind of strange object and this, this is interesting. I, I kind of wish that, that I mean, as much as I'm like in awe of these large structures that sit in these urban environments that, um, I mean, I'm talking about real stadiums, that um, I, I also want, wish they had, other, I mean, you can see this with the Olympics, like, you know, you build all these structures for things and then we never, we have to retrofit them. We're like, how, how do we use them? And that's always a mess and it's, it's always kind of tragic. So some kind of flexibility, you know, and understanding that it's going to exist, but the architects know that.